Last time on Legends of the Force, we looked at the first installment of Marvel's Star Wars comic book series, and how they rolled the dice on doing a science fiction comic in a time when those comics weren't considered viable, and how they set about telling a story that would bridge the gap in between the first two films. This time we're looking at the next group of Star Wars novels to come out, a series of novels that went in a slightly different direction than Splinter of the Mind's Eye and Marvel Star Wars did, the Han Solo Adventures series of novels from author Brian Daly. Unfortunately, the backstory section is going to be pretty light, for reasons that are completely beyond my control. Brian Daly, the author of the books in the Hansel Adventures trilogy, died in 1996, five years after Timothy Zahn's novel Heir to the Empire came out, and when the structure of the Star Wars Expanded Universe was still a little more fluid. However, a few things can be in inferred by what this trilogy covers. First off, Unlike Splinter of the Mind's Eye, this book is a prequel to Star Wars instead of a sequel, like with the Marvel comic series or Splinter of the Mind's Eye itself. It's unclear if this decision was made by Lucasfilm or made by Brian Daly himself, and whether this decision was made not to contradict the comic books or just not to risk bumping into future films and contradicting those. Unfortunately, I was not able to find any interviews by Daly on the topic before he passed away. Second, it's clear that Han Solo as played by Harrison Ford, was the breakout character of Star Wars. The love for Han as a daring anti-heroic scoundrel with a low slung blaster, a smart aleck demeanor, and a heart of gold isn't just a new development as of when I'm doing this recording or when the expanded universe as we know it came to be. Consequently, if you're doing stories set before the original film, Han Solo is one of the natural protagonists for the stories. It, that is, if you're sticking with characters from the film for the stories, with the other possible pit being Princess Leia herself. Now, the other big narrative route you can go with is the story of how the Rebel Alliance got the plans for the Death Star. Indeed, that is the route that this fil month's film Rogue One takes, giving a story of how the plans were obtained and the events leading up to the first major victory for, for the Rebel Alliance. Indeed, Star Wars Expanded Universe will give several takes on this in the future, from Dark Forces, both as a game, a novella, and a radio play, to the novel Death Star, which looks at the Death Star itself and its construction. However, at this point, that part of the story is being left well, well alone. The three novels in the Han Solo Adventures trilogy are standalone, more or less. The first novel introduces two characters who show up throughout the rest of the series, but other than that, each story exists more or less on its own. The first novel, Han Solo at Star's End, is a bunch of world building attached to a jailbreak story. The book is Han operating outside of the bounds of the Empire in a region of space known as the Corporate Sector, an area ruled not by the Empire, but by a council of corporations. If the Empire is a fascist state, then the Corporate Sector Authority is a mercantilist government, one focused on maximizing profits, in this case, since they run an area of space, running that area of space in a mercantilist manner, with policies instituted to minimize imports and maximize exports, along with maximizing the means of production and resource extraction. Stuff that makes sense for maximizing their profits. Again, if you're running your government as a business as opposed to an actual functioning government. 
This also makes for the perfect environment for smugglers like Han Solo to operate, and leads to an arms race between smugglers and the corporate sector when it comes to catching them. When one of the few mechanics Han and Chewbacca trust to work on the Falcon, Doc, is captured by the CSA and imprisoned at the secret prison of Star's End, Han is hired by Doc's daughter Jenna, an old flame of his, to help the family members of other people imprisoned at Star's End find the location by delivering a slicer droid disguised as a maintenance droid to these other family members. When Chewbacca is captured during delivery and taken to Star's End himself, and one of the members of the group is revealed as being a CSA spy, Han is to break into Star's End with the rest of the group in order to spring Chewie, Doc, and the rest of the inmates. The second book, Han Solo's Revenge, is set in an unspecified time later. Han and Chewbacca have to have some emergency repairs done on the Falcon, changing some of the systems from electronic parts to fluidic parts. However, these parts are less reliable, so to get some quick cash for repairs, Han and Chewie take a blind cargo contract, which means they don't know who the client is, and they don't know what the cargo is. And if this sounds like a bad plan to you, then you're right. When Han and Chewie find out they've taken a job with slavers, they're not exactly pleased. They kill the slavers who try to hijack Han's ship and then proceed to hunt down the rest of the organization for three reasons. First, they're owed money for the job, which admittedly they didn't do, but that's because slave trading gets you the death sentence in the, the corporate sector. Second, they have some very significant objections to slavery especially in the case of Chewbacca. And third, they tend to have objections with people trying to steal their ship. It's their ship. They like it. It's the Falcon. Through all of this, Han and Chewie get caught up in a corporate sector security investigation of the slaver operation, led by an attractive female detective, and also have to deal with a skip tracer who wants to seize the Falcon as collateral for one of the debts of the ship's former owners. Oh, and a guy named Galandro, who is one of the fastest gunslingers, or blaster slingers as the case may be, in the galaxy. The final book in the trilogy, Han Solo and the Lost Legacy, has Han coming to the aid of an old buddy named Bedur. Bedur has a map to a long-lost treasure, the treasure ship of Zin the Despot, who is presumed lost when his flagship, the Queen of Renroom, vanished into hyperspace. Bedur's friend, Hasti Trojow, has a map to the ship, or rather her sister did, and the sister stashed it right before she was killed by a slaver who she stole the map from. Now, Han, Chewbacca, Hasti, and Bedur have to contend with the gone feral descendants of the ship's original crew, the slaver and his men, and once again Galandro. In this last case, Galandro has joined forces with the slavers so he can get a rematch with Solo, this time planning to get revenge for having been disgraced and embarrassed by Solo in their last match. Considering the story is focused on Han and Chewbacca, all the characterization is generally for them. We learn that Han was former Imperial military, but was drummed out of the service due to what I'll describe as the noodle incident until we get a description of it. We know that Chewie is older than Han, to a degree that the two rib each other about their age, with the implication that the Wookiees are a very long-lived species. Something that's borne out by the current movie series, since Chewie has been canonically been around for the fall of the Old Republic, Rise of the Empire, Fall of the Empire, Rise of the New Republic, and the Appearance of the First Order. Han and Chewie have a limited number of mechanics they'll trust with the ship. Chewie is also a very skilled engineer, at one point making an improvised glider out of a dead avian animal, a tripod, and one of the ammo bandoliers for his bowcaster. Also, the significance on the red stripe of, on Han's pants comes up here. It's described as a Corillian blood stripe, and it can only be earned through an act of heroism. Great heroism. As the stories are set in a different region of space, we get a whole bunch of world building for this region and its power structure. The first major bit is the corporate sector itself, an additional government in the galaxy that is tolerated by the Empire, but for reasons that aren't clear. Now, at this point, the prequels have not been written yet, but considering the major powers of the Separatists were corporate organizations like the Trade Federation and the Banking Clan, it is entirely possible that the concept of the Separatists and what groups made them up were an outgrowth of the corporate sector from the early expanded universe, with Lucas and later writers planning on making the CSA the remnants of the Separatists. 
and by later writers, I mean later writers in the EU. Indeed, larger economic guilds are introduced in the series. We meet the Performers Guild, and later on in the Expanded Universe, we'll be introduced to the Bounty Hunters Guild. We learn that Han is not the first owner of the Millennium Falcon. It's not clear if the debts the previous owner had incurred were Lando's, or if they belonged to someone even further back than Lando Calrissian. We learn that you can break the lock of a tractor beam by interposing another object in between the emitter and the beam. In some cases, the ship that's emitting the beam, this works only if they have, like, one emitter on, locked on your ship, or one emitter in general. So this is something that probably wouldn't work on Star Destroyers, and certainly would not have worked on the Death Star. We're also introduced to a variety of iconic Star Wars Expanded Universe vehicles, including the Z-95 Headhunter and the Swoop Bike. The last is particularly notable as these books were published well before just the concept of speeder bikes were introduced in Return of the Jedi. Finally, we get our first big lost ship here, and we're going to get a whole bunch more of these as the Expanded Universe goes on. Now, we still don't get the story of how Han got the Falcon here. Whether Brian Daly wanted to tell this story and was vetoed by Lucas due to work being underway in Empire, we can't say. Jenna and her crew at Star's End can be considered the precursor of the outlaw tech and slider slicer archetypes that we would see in later Star Wars RPGs. Also, at Star's End has a space gangster with probably one of the best names in all Star Wars space gangsterdom. Platu two for one. The final book in the series implies that Han's next move is to head to Tatooine and work with Jabba. Normally I just put this under world building or characterization, except for how the job is worded. Han isn't planning to approach Jabba to work for Han working for Jabba. Han's approaching Jabba as a potential investor. This may be where the writers of The Force Awakens got the idea of Kanji Club and the Guavin De Death Gang being investors, again, investors, in Han's Rathtar job, as opposed to them hiring Han for the Rathtar job. If Star Wars is Flash Gordon-inspired pulp adventure, well, Flash Gordon and Lensman-inspired pulp adventure, then the Han Solo Adventures trilogy is inspired by the kind of pulp adventure films that generally had Humphrey Bogart in them back in the day, like The African Queen, like some of the more adventurous uh, detective films, that sort of thing. Han Solo's Revenge is a hard-boiled investigation and adventure story. Han Solo at Star's End is a jailbreak story, and then there's Han Solo and the Lost Legacy, which is, honestly, a Indiana Jones story with Han Solo in it instead of Indiana Jones, and which was written and published well before Raiders of the Lost Ark was even conceived. All three are incredibly solid works of adventure fiction, which also fit in really well with the Star Wars universe, and I completely understand how, why these works were so very formative to the Star Wars expanded universe. Next time, we come to the second block of Marvel Star Wars comics as we go from The Empire Strikes Back to Return of the Jedi. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.